Good morning, Pastor French here with Life Renewed Ministries. Continuing our study in Galatians, uh, we've been on this several weeks now, and I, for one, have thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I really like reading the Word of God and then going back and rereading that. Uh, I think that's why it's taken so long here in Galatians. We're in chapter 3 today, and I want to read for you verses 10 through 19. So let's get right into God's Word here in Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. Paul's talking about that the law brings a curse. And uh, and it's one of those, it's, it's that biblical teaching that he's trying to get across that if you want to get to heaven, it's not by being legalistic and it's not being obedient to the law or doing good works, I suppose is a better way to say that. He's talking about it's for by grace are you saved through faith. And we read that in Ephesians. Well, here in, in uh, chapter 3, verse 10, he talks about that the law really brings a curse to all mankind. And he, he writes it like this. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Let me pause for just a moment. Paul is making reference to a couple of teachings that's out of the Old Testament that we will read about in Deuteronomy and also in uh, Habakkuk. My old professor used to call it Habakkuk. And that just sounds kind of kooky when I say it like that. But whether it's Habakkuk or Habakkuk, uh, Paul's making reference to some Old Testament teaching uh, that's there. Verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we, we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. And here he's talking about the promise of God really doesn't change. Though it is only man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it, meaning man can't change God's covenant. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, plural, as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. God is the one who establishes the covenant, and that God's covenant does not change unless God changes the covenant. And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And this is a great question here. What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Here, here's a great question to ask as we start on this teaching today. How can God's people live in righteousness when they willfully choose to neglect God's call to live righteously according to his plan? I think that's a powerful question to ask. How can, how can we, as God's people, how can we live in any kind of a, a holy state or a righteous state if we willfully choose to neglect or ignore or go against those principles that God has established that we might live according to his plan. Paul, in his defense of faith by grace, is referencing the Old Testament of which many people would be reading his letter, especially to the church at Galatia, referencing that. And it's also as a counter to the Judaizers who are pushing the, the law, the, the law of Moses. 
So Paul is referencing the Deuteronomy teaching, the law of Moses, and also the, the prophet Habakkuk. The Old Testament prophet Habakkuk was very concerned that God's people really wanted, they really desired, they wanted to be blessed by God. And they were even saying they wanted to be blessed by God on the one hand. And yet on the other hand, they ignore the call of God to live according to the law. And here was the dilemma for Paul. Paul's dilemma here is that God's new covenant called for Christians those who were following after the teaching of Jesus Christ, who had accepted Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. God's new covenant called for the, the early church, for the Christians, and it's still valid today, to live righteously by faith in Jesus and not according to the law. Now, you need to understand this when you're understanding Paul's defense of faith in Jesus Christ and that the church should live that way, that the Christians, we should live by faith in Jesus. That's how we become righteous before the Father and not according to a set of do's and don'ts. Now, let me give you a little caveat here. The do's and don'ts, and I'll just reference the, the Ten Commandments, those are still applicable to all of us today. It's a good thing not to uh, not to kill, not to murder, uh, not to uh, lie, cheat, steal, not to uh, cheat on your wife, uh, to honor your parents. Those are all good things. What Paul is using here is the defense was not a, a, a wholesale abandoning of 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 the law, but not using the law as the foundation to get to heaven. In Deuteronomy 27, 26, Paul's interpretation of that, which he references in the Scripture verses in Galatians 3 that I just referenced, he's basically saying that the Old Testament law cannot be wholly or fully or completely kept. Why? Because the law only condemns men. It was by faith that men and he gives an example like Abraham were justified by God himself, not by keeping the law. Now, why is that important for us to understand? Because Abraham was before the law was given. And as a proof to what he's talking about, Paul points back to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, and that reference for us is in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, when he says, Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. He, and, and he makes that very clear. It's evident. It's very uh, clearly seen that no person, no man, no woman, no child, nobody is justified by the law before God. And he says, that's crystal clear. And then he says, for the righteous man shall live by faith. Some have suggested in the research that I was going through here in the study uh, for today's teaching, have suggested that Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4 in its context, is not necessarily, it doesn't jive, it doesn't square with what Paul is teaching. And, and what they're trying to, they'll say is that the issue, we're told, is not uh, faith as opposed to works, but faith as opposed to arrogance and pride. And, and you've got to think with me on that. If a person proclaims that they they are saved or they're going to heaven because of their works, then what really takes over is not grace in their heart or humility. What takes over in their heart and their mind and their life and their lifestyle is one of arrogance and pride. I keep the law better than you. I'm a better person than you. That is contrary to what the Bible teaches of the new covenant, the New Testament, the, the, the change from the old covenant to the new covenant that God initiated. The old covenant reminds us and demonstrates and points for us this fact. You can't become holy. The law only serves to show that we are not holy people. Why? Because we're constantly breaking the law. And here's, here's something that is important for us to know. 
is that the person who relies upon their works for salvation, I would say, I, I want to say often, but I, I would say it like this, 100% of the time, they become prideful. And I think when you read Paul's uh, interpretation here of the law and the grace of God, that's a key consideration for him, is that if you say that you're more righteous than the other person, then you negate what Paul writes in Romans, saying that the Jew and the Gentile are the same. And so the immediate context here, uh, referencing Habakkuk chapter 2, is, is as far as that concerned, it's a broader context and it's much more significant than what we would even be prone to think. The prophet Habakkuk was complaining to God about, about the iniquity of the people of God. And specifically, he protested, Habakkuk, the prophet, protested that the nation's sins had become clearly seen or clearly evidenced by one, one huge factor. The nation neglected the law. So the prophet Habakkuk was saying, here, we've got a terrible situation. And as an example, let me read uh, out of Habakkuk chapter one. Why dost thou make me see iniquity? This is Habakkuk one, verses three and four. Why dost thou make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is no, never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. My friends, you see what's going on here. It is the sin of God's people that so greatly disturbed the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. And because where there was sin, it seemed like it abounded that much more. Sin was evidenced not by the very fact that they lived a sinful life in the way that you and I might define sinfulness, uh, you know, and you can pick any sin you want to. But here's what the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk was deeply concerned with. They disregarded the law and they did not live in obedience to the law. God's response to Habakkuk's protest is that he's going to chasten the people. And for that, that chastening, because there was going to be uh, the Chaldeans that would come in and would, uh, would oppress uh, God's children, that thought was horrifying to the Old Testament prophet because here's what he said, that the Chaldeans— they're more wicked and violent. And this is almost funny, but it's true. The Chaldeans are more wicked and no more violent than the people of God. And so it's like, God, you're going to, you're going to punish your people with even more violent people. And it leads to this question. Uh, it's not an original question to me, uh, I, meaning I didn't come up with the question, but it's a question that theologians and commentators have asked so many times. How can a God so righteous use a nation so wicked to correct his people? And when you read the Old Testament, Habakkuk was waiting for God's response, and God's answer is that the pride of the Chaldeans is sinful, and they will eventually be punished because, what he says, in contrast, the righteous, if you're going to be righteous, in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, if you're going to be righteous before God, the Old Testament prophet was told by God himself that the righteous will live by faith. Boy, that lays a great foundation for us to understand when we talk about for by grace are you saved through faith. And, and Paul makes reference in Galatians that the faith of Abraham is not, is not becoming Abraham, but looking at the faith that Abraham uh, daily demonstrated in God, that's what we are to do. It's rightly observed that faith could actually be translated this way faithfulness. Here's what's so important for us is that if we are going to be people of God, men and women of God, then we have to be people who live according 
to God's plan of salvation, and then we have to live in faithfulness to that. It, it's easy for us to consider faithfulness and faith, but for me, when I read that, Paul understood exactly what it meant to live in faith and to live in faithfulness. And what he was talking about is that don't allow pride to overwhelm you to the point thinking that it's your goodness, your works that gets you or will get you to heaven. Because all that he was talking about, Paul in Galatians, all that he was talking about, or any person who is going to be righteous in faith, the only thing that they can do is trust God and to live in faith in that trust in accordance with Habakkuk's realization that Israel was unable to obey God or to keep the law in his day, Paul was making the the argument, therefore, by faith, you must live. And that explains this. It's impossible to keep the law. Because were it possible to keep the law, it would have been easy for them to uh, obtain salvation But Paul is making it very clear. And and you've got to understand, Paul is writing from the historical perspective and the historical personal background that he was a Jew. He was a Hebrew, but he was also well-versed in the Old Testament law, having been a Pharisee himself. So it's not like he's cherry-picking verses. It's not like he's making something up. It's not like he's trying to come across and say, uh, listen, if anybody deserves salvation, I do, because I kept the law, because he says before God in matters of the law, he was blameless. And the when, when he makes this quote here, he also references uh, Deuteronomy and Leviticus in addition to Habakkuk, and he, he uses this quote out of Galatians chapter 3, and it's in uh, verse 12. Let me turn back. And he says, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them or the man who practices them or the man who exercises the law, he's going to have to live by them. If you say that the law is sufficient or the doing or the performing of the law is sufficient, then you have to do more than just say you're going to do it or say that you're going to have to do it. You have to actually perform it. And Paul cites as his his proof that the, the key governing principle for the law keepers is works and not faith. And then he says that if you choose to live under the law, then you need to know this. You're going to have to operate every day 100% governing your life and your lifestyle by the principle of the works, while the one who chooses grace we operate our life by faith. And here's a, here's a great consideration. There is a movement among some people today that says that grace covers all of our sins, therefore we can live any way that we want. Paul's response would be, absolutely not. The person or the people or the group or the organization that says, for by grace are you saved through faith, therefore I've accepted the grace of God by the faith of him, now I can live any way that I want. They are deceived. They've never truly been born again. And I think that's the real issue for Paul, because grace does not give us license to sin, but the faith that we have placed in the hope of Jesus Christ gives us a revelation that our life and our lifestyle has changed. And since we have changed, we desire to live in a different life, a different lifestyle. That's why the person who has been born again, who has encountered Christ, who has had their sins forgiven, who has they've met Jesus at the foot of the cross, they want to go to church, not in order to hope that that going to church gets them to heaven, but they want to be in worship because they want to honor God and thank him for what he's accomplished for them. At issue for Paul is the same issue for me here. 
the person who professes knowing Jesus or they've been born again, and yet they refuse to be regular worshipers of Jesus Christ. And by that, I mean assembling together with other believers. The person who does not assemble together with other believers, we can we just say it like this? Something's wrong. If a person says they know Jesus Christ and yet they never study his word, they never fellowship with other believers, they never go to worship services, they're not consistent in following after Christ. Can we just say they're not just backslidden? Can we say they've never encountered Jesus Christ? I know, I know people will say that's being very critical of me to point that out because we all have family members who profess knowing Jesus. Oh, I was, I accepted Jesus as my savior. Oh, I've been baptized. My name's on the church roll. While all of those things are commendable, none of those things save. It's the grace of God and the fact that we have put, placed our trust in him and by faith we are saved. The Bible tells us that every one of us who acknowledges that we believe in our heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, these people are saved. Maybe this will help. I, I read this illustration from uh, a retired pastor, Bob Deffenbaugh, and I've read a lot of his material an awesome man of God. He gave this illustration, and let me read the illustration for you. He says, our family's medical insurance, and he gives the name of the company. He says, our insurance is known as an HMO, a health maintenance organization. And he says, they actually have two basic health insurance plans. Uh, we see these advertised on television all the time, uh, whether it's William Shatner or Joe Namath or uh, Jimmy J.J. Dynamite Walker. We see these advertisements all the time. And the insurance that uh, Pastor Deffenbaugh was talking about was a plan A and a plan B. And he says under plan A, all costs are paid. All prescription drugs can be obtained by a mere $1 prescription. And he says, unfortunately, we have plan B, which means that we must pay $5 per pr procedure. And he writes, that's still a bargain. And we pay full price for our prescriptions. He says, recently, I picked up a prescription for which the druggist accidentally billed me $1. When I told the, the druggist that I had plan B and not plan A, he said, oh, well, that's a mistake. So he charged him. Not the one dollar it had he plan A, he charged him twenty two dollars. In today's scenario, I think even that would still be a bargain for a lot of people. And he said, here's what he says it was painfully obvious that plan A was better than plan B. And following that same analogy, Pastor Deffenbaugh writes this Paul's gospel, grace through faith, was plan A. And the Judaizers had concorded. Uh, uh, or not con or concocted. Uh, I wanted to say perverted, and I got the two words confused. They wanted to pervert the message of the gospel to that plan that we might just call, as Deffenbaugh would say, Plan B. And he says, to be sure, there's only one plan when it comes to the gospel, Jesus Christ. In verse 12, Galatians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul said that if you follow plan A, meaning if you operate in faith, you live by faith, the results are a matter of grace. If you follow plan B, the Judaizers gospel, what Paul called a perverted gospel in Galatians chapter 1, here's what he says, you've got to live by works. You cannot, you cannot mix the two plans. You either choose the one or the other, but you cannot combine the plans. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5, is cited as proof by Paul that the law operates on the basis of works, not on faith. And Paul was saying, that if you're going to live by faith, it needs to be by faith alone in Jesus Christ. You cannot bring the mixture in and think that that will be sufficient. And let me take a moment as we start to head towards the home stretch on our teaching today. A lot of people today that I have encountered have mixture in their life. They, they treat 
their faith as if it is a mere religion. And maybe it is just a religion to them. They're superstitious. They believe in luck, good luck, bad luck, no luck. And they think that their life and their lifestyle is merely chance. Uh, I've even heard some Christians say, well, karma controls their life. The person who says karma controls their life, they're not a Christian. Go ahead and get mad at me. Because if you believe in luck, then your life is predicated on every whimsy that comes your way or by every direction of whatever good luck or bad luck you might think that it might be. Because if the law can bring a curse upon men, is the law then not able to condemn all men because of our failure to meet the demands of the law? If the law brings us condemnation, uh, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, uh, honor your father and mother. If you don't do any of those things or you say, well, I've broken those, uh, don't take the Lord your God's name in vain. How many people do you hear that? And people use that today. People use profanity, profanity today as if it means absolutely nothing. And what's shocking to me, I've heard Christians, those who say they know Jesus, talk like we would say it like this, like a sailor on leave. And I don't mean to put down the sailors. I've known some really outstanding men and women from the Navy. The important thing here to know and for us to understand, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I think that's the key consideration that Paul is trying to get across. Do not lean on your own understanding, as Proverbs chapter 3 tells us, but in all our ways acknowledge Him and turn our hearts, turn our lives to Him. We need to allow the grace of God to filter down from our mind into our heart. And we need to know that we are only saved, we are only born again, not by church attendance, but by the grace of God. But when the grace of God touches your life, you want to be in church. You want to study His Word. And my friends, I'll go back to saying it like this. If you're not doing any of those things, something is wrong. But today, you can change that. Today, you can say yes to Jesus. Today, you can let your life be changed. Today, you can be forgiven. Today, you can become a new man or woman before God. Ask Christ to come into your heart. Ask Him to forgive you of your sins. Ask Him to put you on the right path. Go to church this coming Sunday where they really teach and preach the Bible, and you will discover what it means to have a life renewed. Until next week, God bless.